Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? So uh, why don't you just quickly turn to the person next to you? Yes. <laughs> turn to the person next to you and give them a big smile. Just do that. Give them a big smile and say, you are an heir. You are a co-heir with Jesus. And uh, you don't need to say this. I just want to say that we are not here to be religious. We are here to have and to be in a relationship with God. Amen. And uh, I want to just declare this over people. And I want to ask you this morning that you would please open your heart. Uh, a word came in worship of uh, someone just had a picture of this beautiful old door. And uh, this door had a beautiful old lock on the door. And uh, this door was locked, couldn't get in. But on the other side of the door, there were these chains and there, were this, there was this barricade, this steel bar across the door, so you couldn't open it. And it's just, just like God was saying, listen, I have every key of every, of every lock of every door, but you can barricade your heart. You can barricade your door. And I want to just say over people here this morning, that God is declaring over every single person that you are a son, that you are a daughter of God and that you are loved by him, but please open your heart because God wants to meet with you. You are an heir. You are a co-heir with Jesus, a co-heir with Jesus. And there's an excitement in my heart because of this or because of that this morning, because God is wanting us to come to this realization that we are sons and daughters of God. Because that will change the way that we live. And even as I stand here this morning, forgive me if I've shared this story in the past or before. But as a child, I was the kid at school that went before class to the teacher crying. Saying, please don't let me do my oral publicly in front of the classroom. Because I had this incredible fear of speaking. Uh, public speaking, this incredible fear of talking in front of people. I would go to the teacher and say to the teacher, please just let me come during break time and let me just do my oral just with you and me in the class. And uh, I just love how God has this incredible sense of humor that for a living I preach, for a living I share. And the, the, the problem was this, is that I began as a child believing a lie. I began as a child developing a core belief, a false negative core belief within my heart that I was shy and that I couldn't speak publicly. And yet today I preach. Yet today I've traveled to many countries and I'm not making this about me, but God has anointed every single one of us to proclaim, every single one of us to preach this, good, this gospel of good news. Amen? Amen. And so if you're sitting here this morning and you're saying, Anton, I'll never do this and I'll never do that. I want to say to you, don't allow negative core beliefs into your heart. We are children of God. We are heirs of God. We are co-heirs with Jesus. And that is what I want to talk about this morning. <clears throat> I want to talk about two things this morning. Firstly, I want to talk about what it means to be an heir of God and what it means to be a co-heir with Jesus. That's what I want to start with. And then, friends, I want to talk about what happens when we develop a core belief or core, or core values around this incredible truth. Heirs of God, children of God, and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And I want to just say this. I, I want to say that you can know a truth, but choose to live a lie. You can know a truth. You can know the word of God, but still choose to do nothing with it. Choose to not live it out. Choose to not become what we read. And I want to say to you, I want to read my Bible and I want to open my Bible every single morning with this mind. Holy Spirit, let me become what I read. Let me become what I read. Let what I read become such a core belief, such core values within my heart that that would shape the way that I live. That is my heart for us this morning, that there would be healthy core beliefs in people. And even as I was, as we were just worshiping, I just felt to declare this because this is what the Father is declaring over people today. 
He's declaring over every single one of us from here to over here and everyone in between. He declares over you this morning, you're a son and you're a daughter. You're an heir. You're a co-heir. And it changes the way that you live. It changes the way that you live. And so that is what we're going to look at this morning. But before we go into this, I want to ask two massive questions. You see, as a, as, a, as a child at school, I was hesitant to speak publicly. I had this core belief that I was shy, still shy, but it's by the grace of God. It's by the supernatural grace of God, the grace of God that enables us to do the impossible that I stand here this morning and I can preach. It's by His grace. But it's also with a revelation of the Father's goodness. It's a revelation, a supernatural, spirit-filled revelation that my Father is good all the time and that He loves me, that He cares about me. He loves me and He cares about, you, about me. It changes the way that we live. And so I want to ask two questions. The first question is this, is who do you say is your Father? And I want to ask that question and I want to ask every single person to answer that question in your heart. Who do you say is your father? And the second question is this, is do you know God as your father? Because you see, those two questions will change the way that you live. If we catch a healthy biblical revelation, a spirit-filled revelation as to those two questions, it will change the way that you live. It will change the way that you interact with the world around you. It will change the way that you interact with those you love, mo love most. And without a doubt, if we catch this revelation that God is good and that God is our Father, it will bring kingdom change wherever we go. Wherever we go, in any situation, wherever we go, it will bring kingdom change because we realize we are heirs of God. We are co-heirs with Christ Jesus. And a passage that has been on my, on my mind and on my heart for quite some time, massively on my heart, is this passage found in Romans chapter 8, if you want to quickly turn there. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, 14. Just even as I, as I stand here and I'm looking looking at everyone seated here this morning, there's a tenderness in my heart. There's a tenderness in my heart because there are people here this morning that have lost focus of God the Father in their lives. And God wants to declare over every single one of you that you are loved by Him. Romans 8 verse 14, For all, bearing in mind the two questions that I've just asked, who do you say is your Father and do you know God the Father? as your father. Romans 8 verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Amen. Are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. It's important. You did not receive something to fall back into fear. I want to say to every single believer here this morning, every single heir here this morning, Believer here this morning that your portion is not fear. Your portion is not anxiety. You have received the spirit of sonship. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are what? Children of God. And if children, then heirs, I've underlined this in my Bible, heirs of God and fellow heirs, or some translation says co-heirs with Christ. Don't just stop there. Many preachers just stop there. There's a condition. This is the condition. Provided, provided, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Something that God has placed on my heart for the last two days, as I've already said, is what it means to be an heir 
what it means to be a co-heir with Jesus. And as I've been waiting on God and just waiting in the presence of God and studying and looking at scripture and looking at context of what it meant to be an heir back in the day, God began to give me a little bit of a better understanding of what it means to be an heir, what it means to be an heir back in the day. And we need to understand a couple of things back in biblical times, what it meant to be an heir. Firstly, to be an heir involved, that there was, be, a, be an heir meant there was legal rights involved. Legal rights involved, number one. Secondly, there was inheritance involved. Thirdly, there was responsibility involved in being an heir. But two of the greatest things that we need to understand about being an heir back in the day was this. It involved position and it involved identity, who you are. Identity, who you are. And to be a co-heir with Jesus is to have, have access to everything that he has made available to you and I. Everything. Isn't that amazing, friends? It is because of Christ, it is because of what Jesus has done for us on that cross that we have access, that we have this ability to become co-heirs with him in this world. And so what did it mean back in the day to be an heir? Just to give you a little bit of a definition, to be an heir back in the day was to be one who inherited or who was entitled to a future inheritance, usually received by the property of a deceased person, particularly on the basis of the law and usually by means of a will. So if someone died, your father died, you would what? You would inherit. There would be an inheritance that is left to you. I want to just stop there. When your father died or when a relative died, what would be given to you is a will. And in that will would be, would be stated what you would inherit. I want to just stop there. I find that very interesting that Jesus paid with his life, laid down his life so that by faith, when we place our faith in him, we become co-heirs with him. Co-heirs with him. I find it interesting that it is the will of God. It is the pleasing will of God to give you what? The kingdom. It is his pleasure and his will to give you the kingdom so that you can become an heir as we place our faith in Jesus. To be an heir back in the day meant that there would be an inheritance. An inheritance that you never worked for, but someone else did. I find it interesting that Jesus did it for us on our behalf. And that it's not by works, it's by faith. That we become heirs and co-heirs with Jesus. It's incredible. It's incredible. An inheritance wasn't something that that you worked for and now, now you've got it. It is someone else working for that inheritance on your behalf. I say, thank you, Jesus. I say, thank you, Father, that you are good. It's a good father that leaves an inheritance to his children. I've got a good father and I've got a rich Jewish brother. His name is Jesus. <laughs> and I am a co-heir with Jesus. Just love that. Under the patriarchs, the property of the father was always divided amongst the sons of his legitimate children. And you can read about that in Genesis chapter 1. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 24, chapter 25. And usually you see that the eldest son always got the biggest portion of the inheritance. But even if you were a younger son, you would also inherit. Why? Because you were an heir. You are an heir. Succession property was a matter of right and not of favor. It was your right, listen very carefully, it was your right as an heir to claim your inheritance. To claim your inheritance. I just love this next thing. Heirs inherited two things. They inherited property, but they also inherited power. And I want to just stop there. The church today has inherited the church today has been given property, has been given territory in God, but we've also been given power to occupy what belongs to us. And I want to say to you today that God wants to break limitations. Even as we were stand, as I was standing here this morning, it was like I, I felt like I was standing on one side and God was like calling us to move across into what belongs to us, into what belongs to us. 
But we need to understand we've been given the power, we've been given the authority, the pre-permission to occupy what is ours. Because we are an heir, we are heirs. We are co-heirs with Jesus. And Paul tells us who children of God are. Children of God are those who are led by the Spirit of God. I'm led by the Spirit of God. You are led by the Spirit of God. And in John chapter 8, you don't need to turn there. In John chapter 8, Jesus talks to the Jews of the day. And they have this debate with Jesus. They have this argument with Jesus as to who their father is. They say, well, Abraham was our father. Then they say, no, we've only got one father. It's God is our father. And they have this debate with Jesus. And Jesus says to him, you're right. You're just like your father, your father, the devil. And I think it would offend many people today. But why did Jesus respond in this way? Jesus responded in this way because the Jews of that time reasoned, thought like the enemy. They reasoned like the enemy. And I want to say to you as children, as heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus, we cannot afford to take our eyes off the fact that we are sons and daughters of God. That we are heirs with Jesus. Because the moment we take our eyes off God, our Father, we will begin to reason from a worldly point of view. And wherever you are, whatever job you have, the moment you take your eyes off Jesus, the moment you take your eyes off the fact that you are an heir of God, you will begin to reason like the enemy. That is not our portion. And in verse 40, I want to say this, that it is the insecure that will always be in the defense of their true identity. The moment Jesus touched or just highlighted or questioned them about their identity, they retaliated and started manifesting like the enemy. God's calling us to be secure sons. God's calling us to be secure daughters. That when we wake up in the morning, we are so comfortable in our own skin because we know that we are loved by our Father. That even when we are questioned, even when we are opposed and when there's persecution and opposition, we manifest something of the kingdom of heaven because we know who we are. Yeah. I find it very, very interesting that the moment Jesus was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness, I want to just, just make that very clear, that Jesus wasn't led into the wilderness because it was his own idea. He was led into the wilderness to pray and to fast for 40 days Led by the Spirit of God. He's a son. He's an heir of God. The moment Jesus was led into the wilderness to do so, the first line of defense that the enemy attacked Jesus on was what? Was his identity. If you are the son of God, you will tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, you will throw yourself down from this high place and nothing will happen to you. If you are the son of God, if you are an heir. And the third one or the third time that the enemy attacked Jesus was this. So he took Jesus to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms of the earth and said to him, if you bow down and if you worship me, I'll give you everything. See, the enemy forgot that he is. Jesus is an heir of God, the heir of God. And everything already is his. <laughs> he is the son of God. He remains the son of God. He is the heir. You see, Jesus wasn't unsettled by his identity as an heir because God spoke it. He knew his identity because of his relationship with his father. And in Hebrews chapter one, there's something amazing that said there. It says that long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our father by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by what? By his son, Jesus, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Jesus wasn't unsettled in his identity as an heir. And God has called the church today to not be rattling when there's pressure, to not be going here and there with the next church fad, but to be settled to be settled, to be a people that preach Christ. Because as we preach Christ, all men will be drawn to him. Amen? Amen. So what, I want to say this, what you believe regarding who your father is and what he has blessed you with as an heir will change the way that you live. 
It's called a core belief. It's called a core value. And I believe that's where there's a huge shift taking place throughout the church today. Everywhere I go, I see God's, God just changing hearts. And people, believers, are catching a greater degree of revelation, truth, in what it means to be an heir of God, what it means to be a co-heir with Jesus. Because the truth, friends, will set you free, but living with truth will keep you free. Will keep you free. Living with a core belief, core values in your heart that God is a good father and that you are a son or a daughter of God and a co-heir with Christ Jesus will keep you free. Will keep you from falling back into a spirit of fear. There's so much of the church today that goes from a place of fear to a place of victory. From a place of fear to a place of victory. Why? Because they haven't settled this thing of who they are in Christ Jesus. I'm a son. I'm a daughter of God. And the spirit that I've received is not a spirit of fear. It's a spirit of adoption. By who I might cry, Abba Father. It talks about relationship with him. And there's a poverty mentality that can come into the heart of the believer. But I want to say to you, a poverty mentality is simply a spirit of fear. But that spirit, that poverty mentality over the church today is broken when the sons and the daughters of God yield themselves to what? To the spirit of God. To the spirit of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. This is good news. This is the good news today. That you are heirs and that you have received the spirit of adoption and not of fear. The lie of the enemy is that he wants believers to believe the lie of fear. He wants believers to believe but also live the lie of fear. I want to say to you, the enemy's native language, first language, is fear, is lies, is deceit. But as heirs, as co-heirs with Jesus, friends, when these beliefs, these core values are established in our hearts, that we are heirs, that we are sons of God, and that our identity is in Him, we become a people that are unstoppable. We become a people that are strong, a people that do not rattle when there's, when there's turmoil. So what is a core belief? Just to give you a definition, what is a core value? A core belief, friends, is like a seed or is like seed. The moment you place it in, in the ground and you, the moment you begin to water these seeds, it will produce fruit, either good fruit or bad fruit. A core belief is something that can be established or that may have been established within you when you were a child. A core belief is something that grows roots, grows roots. A core belief can be a positive core belief or it can be a negative core belief. But I want to say to you that it is our core beliefs that will always speak louder than just our confession. Hence, I want to tell you that the enemy, listen very carefully, the enemy is not intimidated by empty confession. There are many people that go to church around this world Sunday after Sunday, but the enemy is never intimidated by them or is never nervous about them because he simply looks at their lives. He simply looks at what they truly believe. The enemy is never intimidated by empty confession. Friends, I want to say to you that as the church, when we wake up in the morning, the enemy should become very scared and very nervous. Why? Because our mission, our mandate as heirs and co-heirs with Jesus is to destroy the works of the devil. And when we healed ourselves to the Spirit of God, sons and daughters led by the Spirit of God, we become a people that are unstoppable in the hands of God. Because we know who we are. We are in Him. Let me give you an example of a core belief. A core belief. You can have a core belief even just subconsciously that God is good or God is angry with you and it will affect the way that you live. If you have a core belief that God is always angry with you, I'm telling you right now, it will hinder you in your walk with God. 
If you have a core belief that God is angry with you, it will hinder you in approaching His presence, entering, living a life in His presence. But if you have a core belief that God is consistently good all the time, we will live lives being led by the Spirit of God without hesitation and without intimidation, but a Spirit-led life with confidence because He's a good Father. It will change the way that you live. It will change the way you see yourself when you look in the mirror. You'll still see you, you'll still see you but you'll, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> because it's a heart conviction. It's a core belief that is settled within in you. I don't think it's by chance that Paul writes and he says, take every thought captive and make it obedient unto Christ. How is a core or what does it mean to be an heir or co-heir today? As I've already said, I believe that God wants people to have a biblical, spirit-filled revelation as to His goodness. What does it mean to be an heir? What does it mean to be a co-heir? I want to say this. is when there's confidence in His presence, there will be confidence as a co-heir in this world because we know Him. And the message that we preach won't be this insecure little message of, can I give you a little card to come to church? It will be a life that I live because my life has been changed in the secret place, in confidence, in my relationship with my father. That is what it means to be an heir. That is what it means to be a co-heir, bringing something of the reality of heaven to this reality and seeing this reality change, bow to the name of Jesus. That is what it is. That's my core belief. I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. That's my core belief. I'm an ambassador of Christ Jesus in this world. That's my core belief. I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm loved in him. I'm not rejected. I'm accepted in him. That is a core belief. And God wants the church today to establish healthy core beliefs. So how is a core belief established? I want to say to you, a core belief or core value is established through agreement. Through agreement. The enemy has a field day in many believers' lives through their thought life. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That's what Paul writes. Take every thought captive. I want to say to you, as a believer, we cannot afford to have thoughts in our lives, thoughts in our lives, thoughts in our daily lives that aren't in God's heart about us. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. It's not by chance, Paul writes, and he says, take every thought captive. God is looking for a group of people that will say yes, that will agree with who he says they are and will agree with who, who, who he says he is inside of them. How is a core belief established? It is established through agreement. Agreeing with God and not agreeing, not reasoning like the Jews of the day about who their father is and manifesting something of the enemy, but manifesting something of the father, being secure children of God.